President Pavlopoulos, thank you very much for organizing this important discussion and indeed for your compliments. May I also immediately agree and offer the solidarity of the people of Ireland as we are all doing in Europe with the people of Germany at this time and to the Jewish community. And also I suggest as well that before we finish our seminar we should indicate in our statement perhaps a recognition of the vulnerability of the Kurdish people and what is appropriate to address their circumstances. Your Excellencies, it is fitting that we meet at a time of renewal for the European Union and we have a new European Parliament Commission and this gives Europe the opportunity to set a clear course for the next five years. Uh, what I say, might have to say uh, may not strike a, an accord immediately. I believe we should examine, as non-executive presidents, the adequacy of the instruments with which we have been seeking to achieve solidarity, seek to achieve cohesion, seek to achieve, if you like, the inclusion of our peoples. For I think we must look at the assumptions of our policies. My suggestion is that we have been operating within a single paradigm of assumptions in relation to economy, ecology, and society that has failed, that in one term has brought us to the point of disaster. But also, we must ask now, how are we to get to a space where we will have, if you like, once again, a respect for heterodoxy in economic planning and theory and thinking? And have we forgotten that the best times of the European Union when it came nearest to Union was when it respected social protection, when it was speaking of social conclusion and the right to jobs and decent housing, and when we had a role for the state in the provision of universal health? I think a decade ago, the sharp decline in the global economy exposed a number of flaws within our prevailing economic paradigm, our exposure to speculative sources, which we didn't anticipate. And through their influence on the banking system, it dislodged the real economy, resulting in social distress for those least likely to have been the source of the speculative bubble. And that was influenced by theories of extreme free market economics, unrestrained, unregulated market dominance, and a communications order with a discourse that privileged aggressive individualism. After a lifetime in politics, I can recall no time where we had less space for making the case for the role of the state, either in protection or innovation or entrepreneurship. And we paid the price. The poorest, the most vulnerable, paid the price. Social cohesion became a forgotten reference in the Lisbon Treaty. And references to social economy and redistribution were eschewed in favour of a society influenced by what was little less than insatiability by those who were the, the, the richest. I don't believe that redistribution, as I said, you asked, refer to me as a poet, I don't believe that redistribution is almost yet allowed in polite economic conversation in the European Union. I think that paradigm uncontested emerged over four decades with consequences for us all, our institutions, our democracies, our credibility, the credibility of our scholarship, politics, economy, and society. And I think it has resulted, frankly, in increasing inequality, the loss of the European street, and ecological peril. I think the period really has been a long, painful process. Social cohesion we must recover, so agree, dear friends. But it has been damaged enormously. We've had to deal with social, economic, and political stresses, then onto the migration crisis. And let me say immediately in relation to this, I speak as the president of a migrant country, and agreeing with other speakers as well, one that exports the most highly educated people about 17% every year to go to developed economies. These are very valid points. But we're also meeting, dear friends, at a time when multilateralism has been very much under its greatest attack yet. We have come, have come from New York, and really, 
in relation to the general migration crisis. Can we answer a, a question that my dear friend has just said? Why is there not a global response to migration? And why did it become impossible to establish a global fund that could have dealt with issues of source, issues of anticipation, transition, preparation, and so forth? It is really, if you like, about the ideological overhang of that paradigm that has paralyzed us morally. The citizens of Europe, and now especially the younger citizens, but not only them, those people who do remember the health services, who remember social welfare systems and public housing, they believe that we need a new paradigm shift to an ecological social model, the widespread adoption of which is not only an important gesture in terms of intergenerational solidarity, but it is our hope to avoid ecological and social catastrophe. I do believe as well that when we are speaking of the refugee crisis and the wider issue of migration, we've only barely touched on it. What about the benefits of migration? The world was never a sedentary planet. People have been moving on this planet since the Anthropocene first had an effect uh, on nature. We need to move away from an ad hoc approach, I agree on this issue, and to work as partners to resolve the humanitarian crisis. But you must remember that we need a new development model for Africa. The development model we have been offering for Africa, I entirely agree with the President of Estonia in this regard. It is one that we'll have to take. Why, for example, may I ask you a very provocative question, so many here. How is it that anthropology was relevant in times of colonization, but in the post-colonial times, no one spoke about, about anthropology and the recognition of difference after that? We need to take account of there where we are lodging our proposals for security. And what people are looking for in Africa is sufficiency, not insatiability. We are offering insatiability to people who have never had the opportunity of getting sufficiency. I think that the only way from, I agree with the Secretary General, Guterres, in a United Nations starved of money, that the only way for migration to be safe is for it to be sustainable, it should be sustainable and, st and, s and safe, and should be out of volition. I do think, and uh, very, very much as well, how often have we read in the European press that migration brings with it an abundance of positives? That not least, there is no evidence suggesting a figure less than 10 to 12 percent of global gross domestic product that was provided by migrants. No economy in Europe could function without migrants. They provide essential frontline services, and it has been shown empirically, even in relation to the United Kingdom, that migrants are net contributors to their adopted home country. They have not replaced jobs in any one of the three lower socioeconomic categories within the labour statistics in the United Kingdom. And I think that 71 million people have been forcibly displaced from their homes worldwide, 26 million cross-border refugees. Yes, it reflects a great human and institutional failure. And to address this, we need to focus, indeed, on the factors at origin, including, as I said, sufficiency opportunities for livelihood in developing countries that includes appropriate technology, investing in education and training, in building social justice and improving security. But of course then, the dangerous shifts in climate are likely to add huge new numbers uh, to, on ecosystems that can no longer support populations. And as a sociologist, I say as well, the greatest threat facing all of us is our inability to understand urbanization. And the neglected topic of the city, which was in the developed world, is in fact an even more acute problem in relation to the new cities unable to take the huge streams of people uh, that are moving now. How often do we hear reported also that the greatest migration in Africa is within the continent of Africa to countries with very, very le little, little capacity? I do very strongly agree that only if Europe is, as the United Nations High Commissioner has put it, only if Europe is strong and united will Europeans be able to deal with refugee and migration issues in a principled, practical and effective manner. 
But I, deal with, I agree with friends that this is a global matter. But I actually end where I began. The connection between ecology, economy, society, social cohesion and justice. Really, the models we are following are in fact so seriously deficient. We are in Greece. We have been invited to respect intellect and reason. And we've had a powerful plea for compassion, which I entirely support. But I really actually say my greatest concern is that we are not showing the capacity. We, as non-executive presidents, are free from the immediate. We have the opportunity to look both back and forward and think long term. But have we the courage to say the model has failed, the model has not lifted everybody up, the model has repeated and deepened inequality, lost cohesion, is useless as a set of instruments for handling migration, and therefore we must turn with energy and say, in the institutions of teaching, in the, de the journals, we will, in fact, the next five years in the European Union and outward on to the global community be saying, let's do things radically different in a way that can deliver equality, justice, all the pillars that, Professor, that President Pavlopoulos spoke about. Thank you. Michael, thank you very much.